Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. her brand with her appreciation of natural materials and ingredients, the exploration of shapes and forms and contemporary designs that embrace Oaxaca's tradition craftsmanship. Please welcome the founder of Matisse, Cesarelli Miguel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Jazarelli Miguel. How are we doing? We're doing good. Yeah, and you did great there. <laughs> uh, see, we were talking, so I think it's important. We were talking about the importance of names before we got on there, and I always ask my guests, you know, how do I pronounce their names? Um, and we were talking about it, how you actually had your name changed in around the second grade. Tell, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so my mom named me Jocereli Miguel. Uh, my dad allowed my mom to name me, and she chose along, but now a name that I very, very much appreciate and love. Um, But yeah, it was second grade. Um, Yeah, my teacher was like, I can't get it. You're just Jesse from now on. And Jesse has stuck with me all throughout school, all throughout college, all throughout professional life. And really, when I started my business, I was like, this is my time to really shine and embrace the name Jesarelli because nobody has really ever known me that way. So that is the little story behind Jesarelli. <laughs> I love it. So for, for the folks at home, tell us a little bit more about you, your kind of path to where you got here today before we talk about your brand. Okay. So I went to school for interior design. Um, I went to the Art Institute of Portland and I completed my time there. I worked in the commercial interior design world. Um, worked first at a furniture dealership for a few years and then moved towards the architecture and design industry. So my big project there was PDX Airport. Um, and that's something that I'm very, very proud of. So I took a lot of pride there and I finished my, my project. And it was during the pandemic that I started thinking behind closed doors, um, kind of like what I wanted to do. and. I knew I've always had this little niche for textile design and color. And now I call myself a design, a designer, a creator, and a storyteller as well. Yeah. In so fact, that is who I am. yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, your company. It's Matisse, right? Matisse. Yeah. Meaning hue, um, the, the hue of a color in English. Mm-hmm. Now, what is it? So Matisse, we really focus on designing wool textiles, um, but most specifically handmade textiles made in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, Oaxaca, Mexico is in the Southern part and Oaxaca is known for many things. I mean, if you hear about um, Oaxaca, you hear about the mezcal, you hear about the chocolate, you hear about um, the landscape, the food, the culture. And out of all of those things, there's also the hand weaving craft. Um, so I work with artisans in Oaxaca who have been doing this for the past four generations and take great pride in that as well. And I develop my own rug collections or textile collections. And I'll get more into the rug and textile now because, um, Matisse designs informative designs or informative collections that really embrace what Oaxaca is and who or what makes Oaxaca the, the, the state it is. Um, and so the designs are very unique and one of a kind to the point that sometimes they are no longer rugs, but they are now art pieces. Um, so I get a lot of clients purchasing my textiles as wall hanging. So I stopped, I almost stopped um, marketing them as rugs and now I market them just overall general textiles. You know, and I'm looking at them right now. So, folks, 
if, if you haven't had an opportunity to see them, you know, we actually met at the pitch Latino competition. Uh, these are just gorgeous. They're, they're really pretty. They're very individually made. And they're just, again, to your point, this is something you can hang on your wall. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, how did you start it? What, tell us about the beginning of the company. Yeah. Um, so it started for many reasons. One of them being, um, I actually lost my oldest cousin during the pandemic and it, and he was still very young. Um, and it really awakened me and it made me realize you don't know when you're going to go and it can happen at any moment. It can happen to anyone. So I, I quickly, you know, I was awakened. I started thinking of ideas of how I could really do something that allowed me to be happy, fully happy and content with the things that I was doing and be proud of them every single day. Um, so behind closed doors, while I was still, you know, working my full time as an interior designer, I was starting to develop, okay, what can I do? I know I like textiles. I know I like color. This is the time more than ever that people are embracing where they are coming from and being proud of that and, and trying their best to teach others about it. And so I was like, you know what? Oaxaca. Oaxaca is known for so many things. Okay, so let's narrow it down even more. And I was like, okay, so there's cotton weaving, there's the wool rug weaving, there's the basket weaving, like, what do I want to do? And I was like, let's just start with rugs. And so again, middle pandemic, nobody was traveling. Um, so I quickly got on YouTube actually, and I was looking at travel vlogs and I found a travel vlog of a girl that had gone to Oaxaca and as she went through the whole process of, you know, her, her time with this family. And so I connected with her. I asked if I could be connected with the artisans. I did my own research. I found, I found the agency that she went with, connected with the travel agency. The travel agency then connected me with the artisan. And then um, a few families later that I interviewed, I really wanted to find the right fit, you know? So I interviewed a few other families besides the family that I now am with. And I just landed back with the first family that caught my attention and, and seemed excited about the opportunity. And I learned a little bit more of, of just the industry in general, the craft in general. And I got, and I got ready and I, I started working and developing designs and submitted my designs back in March. And by May, I flew down with one of my friends who is also a photographer and photographed the workshop, photographed the whole process, the actual design, did some styling at a beautiful Airbnb. And, and then here we are now, you know, so that is kind of how we started. So tell us, tell me, when was that time, that moment when you realized I can do this? I'm going to, I'm going to pivot from my job, my secure job to being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur? I think it's like, you know, being a Latina myself and being Mexican myself and I see how hardworking we are and I always think of my parents, no matter what circumstance came their way, they have still been a very successful, successful individual. Um, and I'm like, if my parents can do it, knowing that, you know, they immigrated to the U.S. with so little money in such different situations and have been able to be so successful, why can't I do it? You know, I have the creativity. I have the opportunities and the connections. Let's do it. You know, it never hurts to try. I think that's another thing. It never hurts to try. And if I fail, I fail. And if I don't, at least I tried and I saw it. Man, I keep telling these folks I've never failed the day in my life. I either succeed or I learn, right? That's that's because mm -hmm. even if you fail, you're going to learn something from it and you're going to continue. Exactly. To move and right, right. You, you talked about your parents. Uh, are they a big influence in why you're doing this? They are a big influence in the, in the aspect to not give up and to always, always take risks. That's definitely one of the biggest things. Um, 
in regards to design in general, um, they have been my biggest motivators and have always stood, stood strong when I said that I want to do design. And especially when I was like, I want to leave my, you know, full-time corporate job and really fulfill this dream of mine. So, um, and even more to embrace our culture and embrace who we are, and get even closer to that as well. And um, they get very excited also, just like the whole idea of what I'm doing and, and doing it in honor of where we are from as well. Now, is this your first business? It is. It is my first business. So um, it's been an interesting ride so far. So yeah. you went from design school and you said, you know what, I'm going to start a small business. What has been mm -hmm. difficult about starting a small business without knowing much before? Yeah. I would say one of the biggest difficulties I've had so far is trying to wear all the heart, like all the hats in the business. I come with such a creative mind. It's hard for me to take that hat off and focus on the numbers. And I think that's something us creatives lack on because, you know, we're taught to, okay, let's think about concepts. Let's think about, you know, the great stuff of what makes a product and the storytelling and so forth. And then you ask us about the numbers and we're like, you know, we really think about it because it's just not our forte. But the great thing is like, there's people always willing to help as long as you ask for it, of course. Um, so I think that has been one of the most difficult things. But again, knowing that there's support out there has made it much easier. You know, one of the things you, you constantly mention, I think this is actually really good for entrepreneurs to realize and try to focus on too, is the storytelling aspect of, of creating something. Um, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs are focused on the business, right? They mm -hmm. are focused on the numbers. But you, but you kind of talk about it like, hey, let's bring folks in and talk about this piece as a, as a story. How do you do right. that? So first of all, with Matisse in general, I really stuck with that small little tagline that I have, made in Oaxaca, inspired by Oaxaca. Because my goal is to really only be made in Oaxaca, support our artisans and the craft as much as possible, and you know the local economy there, but also be inspired of what is Oaxaca and what makes Oaxaca. So through my designs, my first collection was all about topography, the, the topographic maps of Oaxaca. So I chose four locations that were special to me, two of them being where my parents are from, and the other two was one that I've, a location that I've always wanted to visit. And the other one is Ciudad de Oaxaca, Oaxaca City. You know, it's, it's the heart of Oaxaca. And then moving on to the second collection, it's, it's more about the inspiration or, or the environment of Oaxaca, what makes it special. And that is usually the streets, the brick and stone walls, um, the colorful facades, all of that. So I, I think how we storytell is through design. And the best way to, to do that is actually like verbally going through each design. It's, this is a reflection of this. And this is a reflection. Why those colors? Because of this and that and this. So that is how we storytell. And we try to embrace Oaxaca as much as possible. And, and so essentially what you're, you're kind of creating is like you're identifying inspiration with yourself and then kind of mm -hmm. create an art. How do, you, how do you find inspiration? Going to Oaxaca. Yeah. Or not even going to Oaxaca, you know, because I, I had to develop my first collection without being in Oaxaca at first, right? Because of the pandemic. So that is why, like, okay, like, what is special to me or what? So that's where I chose my parents' um, cities and then where I chose the two locations that I had always wanted to, to go to and visit. And, and you also mentioned when you went to Oaxaca, you found a family, you interviewed a couple of different families to work with. Can you tell us about that process and what do you work with with the family? Like what processes of the, of the rug making do they all do? So they do everything from everything in production, they do. Um, my job is really just to develop these beautiful collections. Um, and how we work is, you know, 
I develop my collections. I have my own master's set of, of color yarns and that is how I develop the, the actual colors of the, of the textiles. Um, I submit my designs. My designs are produced from start to finish. So they still practice all of the traditional methods of production, which is the gathering of the wool um, to then the brushing of it, like physical hand brushing, uh, the washing of it. And again, we don't use any chemically or synthetic soaps or anything like that. We actually use um, a root that produces a, a very beautiful and um, a beautiful soap. So we use that. And then after it's been dried, we continue to brush it again. And then it gets into the um, spindles. And then we actually start the, the weaving of the rug. So it's a whole process. And they, they are the master weavers. So they do it all. They do it all. Man, I I want to see this process because it sounds so cool. Like I want to go. I want to, I want to go to Oaxaca now and go visit, get some inspiration myself. It is. It really is beautiful, especially the natural dyeing. Once you see how we get the pinks and the blues and all of that, it, and to make all these different hues, it it really is. It's like wow, the things the things nature allows us to do. Right, we just have to go and search for it. Yeah. And so, so folks, I'm not sure if too many people are familiar with this, but a lot of the colors that are, um, I like, I was down in Mexico city two years ago or a year ago, and we were going through a tour and they're showing us how they make different colors using plants. They, they mm-hmm. don't use dye artificial dyes. They use plants that are grown right then and there. Uh, and it's really, really unique and fascinating how they're able and they're vibrant colors. And they last, right. you know, forever. You can wash right. them and wash them, and they're gonna last forever. And they keep that vibrancy. Now, now, in the business perspective, what you know, you mentioned this is your first time kind of starting this business. What has been easy about this? What has been what has made it easy, I'd say, has been the community and the support. Um, there's always somebody that is willing to help, whether it's giving a word of advice, whether it's connecting you to someone else, whether it's, you know, lending a a hand at a market or something, but somebody is always willing to help. It's just a matter of asking for it. Or when people really believe in you, they want to be part of it. They want to help and they want to see you succeed just as they have succeeded as well. Um, So that is really what it comes down to. Once you have a community and a support system, it it does become much easier, especially when you're just like a woman owned on your own running the business. Any kind of support really is special and meaningful. So it kind of sounds like the networking, right? How, how, yeah. how important yeah. has networking been to you? So important. So, so important. Um, any way that I can network with either Latino or Latina, you just seem to understand yourself a little bit better when you see somebody, whether it's in the same industry or just another small business owner doing the same thing. Um, People in the design field as well, or just women designers in general or women owned businesses, any kind of networking like that is super special. yeah, uh, I, I can't like stop saying that because it really is super important. I think another thing is I, I've i always practiced networking since college. I always thought it was so important because you never know where it's going to get you. Um, that is how I was able to land my internships, my job opportunities, and it, it still continues to do miracles to this day, right? I, I, completely agree. I cannot agree more. I mean, it's networking, the power of networking. I was talking about it earlier today in a presentation, just the power of networking. Um, I had myself randomly on stage with sugar free because I met his nephew at Syracuse. <laughs> like it's just the most random things, you know, just because, uh, but it, to your point, you know, putting yourself out there and, and, you know, building, building yourself brand. Right. 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 But how did you, so that's how you build your networking, right? You build your self brand. How do you build the Matisse brand? How did you build that? Um, so right now, when we started Matisse, or when I started Matisse, I 
I launched in December 1st of 2021. So I launched on December 1st. And as soon as I launched, I quickly looked at any kind of market that I could do that same weekend. And I found one in Beaverton, it was 10 bucks. And I was like, who cares? Let's do it. So I, I went to the market that weekend or one single night. And that day I got, I went from zero followers to 70 followers. So it's just like, one of them is just being, being in person because people want to see who you are, who, who is running the show, right? Um, nothing like storytelling in person. So that is one way we've been doing it, just doing markets um, or events or trade shows or anything like that. But then obviously months went by and I started learning, okay, I need to be, my products are very different from what you would typically see at a market. I need to be a little bit more specifically or specific of, of where I need to be. So that's when I started looking into markets that were a little bit more costly, but that is where my market was going to be, um, my consumer market. So, so far it's been markets, social media, and because I have my design background, it's also been with designers in, in the industry, whether it's interior designers or architects or whatever it may be, but that has also been a way that we've been able to get the brand out and market ourselves that way. You know, I think you brought up a lot of great points that I want to pull out um, just for the folks that really that are listening. One, I love that you just went out and started doing it, right? And then you're like, let me just figure out what works. And then you started to define who your customers were. And then you understood, okay, now I know who are my customers, who they are. Now I need to go to where they are. You know, and I think that's mm-hmm. very important for the entrepreneurs, those folks that are listening that want to start their own small business. One, uh, just go out there and start doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Truly just start doing it. And then and then you can kind of start to fine tune it. I mean, just like this podcast has been going two years, almost going on two years coming up. It's like I just started doing it. And now I'm starting to get better and better and starting to bring in sponsorship dollars and things of that nature. And things are starting to trickle down. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? But yeah. it's, but just putting yourself out there. To your point, you got to you got to kind of put yourself out there. You kind of um, you know build that. Now, where where is your items now? You mentioned you went from the market. Where are they at now? Like where where can and they recall. be purchased? Oh, okay, sure thing. Yeah, so now they can be purchased at a Portland showroom. It's an interior design boutique, woman owned as well. Um, SMG Collective in Portland. It's in the Pearl downtown area. And now we can also be found in LA at the A plus R showroom in Row downtown LA. Um, And something else is in the works, but there will be further representation of Matisse and other states here in the West Coast as well. More to come on that though. Well, tell us what, without getting into detail, what is the five-year plan? What is the 10-year plan? Where does, where do you plan to see Matisse growing? I would love to see Matisse all throughout the nation. Um, next, I think my next goal would be the East Coast. Um, I kind of hit on the West Coast now. I want to get the East Coast. Um, the other thing is I want to continue to support artisans in any way and capacity that I can. So if that means growing my team to artisans with focuses in different areas like basket weaving, and cotton weaving, then I want to do that. And um, so that is the plan to grow the product line, one, continue the rug collection um, and potentially be in a retailer, a larger retailer that shares the same goals of sustainability um, and supporting artisans. But that is yet to come. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Ned, why, you know, one of the things you kind of mentioned too um, you, you really have a, a focus on really aligning your company with individuals that support artisans. Why is that so mm-hmm. important to you? Because when you, when, you learn, when you learn what it takes to do this kind of product, the time, the physical labor, and you know, all of it, all the steps in order to create this beautiful textile, Not a lot of people understand it, but once you do, you understand why it's valued at the the price that it's at. Um, 
So again, that is where it's my turn to educate people as to why this handcraft item is priced at this at this price. Um, so yeah. I, I hope I answered your question there. <laughs> no, you did great. In fact, you know, one of the things you mentioned too was pricing. How do you mm -hmm. go about like finding the right price? Well, you know, like starting my business, I really had to look at my competitors and I wasn't looking at competitors that were doing mass produced rugs because that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing small batched rugs. And so I looked at what their prices were like if they shared the same kind of style or aesthetic as I did um, and the fiber content as well, then that's kind of how I went with my pricing, but also in a way that my artisans were being paid fairly. I have never negotiated my pricing with them actually. Um, when they have set their prices, I respect it. Um, and that's, that's how I allow myself for them to get paid, for myself to get paid, and for Matisse to get paid to sustain itself as well. So um, that's kind of the pricing structure here at Matisse. I like it. I like it. Now, what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe aspiring female entrepreneurs? For female entrepreneurs specifically, that's a tough one because I, I don't know. I think when it comes to entrepreneurship, it applies to all of us, you know? Um, maybe for females specifically, we could just let's uplift each other as much as we can. Let's um, grow from each other's um, lessons learned or advice. But I think in general with any entrepreneur, I would say learn to have fun because you're doing this because you trust yourself and because you believe in yourself. So find the fun somehow, one way or another, um, and trust yourself. Yeah, it's difficult. Sometimes the numbers are not there that you want to see yet, but remind yourself, you know, like we just started and it's slowly growing um, and embrace any kind of small win that you come across, whether it's your first sell, whether it's um, gaining one new subscriber, anything is worth celebrating, especially when you're on your own. Anything is worth celebrating and embracing for sure. I love it. And you know, that, I think, you know, you mentioned there's some difficult times throughout entrepreneurship. There's those lonely moments you kind of get through it. I think that's one way to kind of get over that self doubt is celebrating those small victories. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's so important because we, we, it's so easy for us to get caught up on the difficult times. Like it's, it's happened to me so many times, but then I remind myself, you know, you did this or you already partnered with two, two retailers um, in the West coast, like keep it going, keep it going. Try to find other avenues. Um, what is next? What's the new collection going to be inspired from? Um, what other cities can you touch on? So there's, there's always something to, to celebrate no matter what. I love it. And, and may I ask when, what is the new, the next uh, series, next iteration, and what would that look like? When, when is that time frame coming out? So I'm really pushing for some time in develop my, my new collection in the summertime so it can be launched for either end of fall, early winter. Um, again, just another collection inspired by Oaxaca. This time I have two concepts in mind. One would be um, insects. Insects is a huge thing in Oaxaca. Some, are, some people are willing to eat it, others are not. Um, and another collection that I'm thinking of is um, corn, because corn is such an important yep. factor yep. In, in culinary in Oaxaca. So still trying to decide which one I want to move forward with. But again, the idea of just embracing what makes Oaxaca special and why people want to visit Oaxaca, right? Yeah, no, I, I love it. In fact, so folks are listening, the collection, as you, you, know, as you mentioned, hopefully come out in the fall. 
I will have this information on the newsletter, which is a great time to plug the newsletter. Please visit theshadesofe.com to go and subscribe to the newsletter. We'll have this information as well as contact information. In fact, how can the folks at home get in contact with you, your social media site, your website, if they're interested in finding out more, how can they find you on the social website? Yeah, website is matizco.com, M-A-T-I-Z-C-O.com. And Instagram is at Matizco underscore. So you will list those. So yes, and they'll you. all be listed as well. <laughs> and I'll make sure they get tagged. Jazzarelli Miguel, thank you so much. The founder of Matiz, a uh, really great conversation. I think you had a lot of golden nuggets for our listeners. So folks, I really do hope you took the time to listen and really listen to what she's saying because I, the way she's building this business is the exact way you should be doing it, right? She she took her time to go out there and network. She understood, okay, who's are my customers? Let me reassess that. Uh, and then really kind of focusing on her expertise and understanding it seems like you know what your zone of genius is, design. Now let me let other people do the other things that may, might not be competent as well as, uh, as my zone of genius, right? So I, I think right. you're doing a phenomenal <laughs> job. I'm excited. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely check out your products. I remember seeing them at the Pitch Latino. So I'm excited for you. I I, I really do hope we do see you across the country because really pretty uh, beautiful rugs, really cool. Again, they could be on the floor or hung up. I think. Personally, I might find it being hung up in my house because they're they're really cool designs. So thank you again so much for being on the show. For those folks listening at home, you can find me at theshadesofe.com or you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and LinkedIn by visiting at theshadesofe. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.